My name is Shane McElroy and welcome to all of you joining us on our fodder planning webinar this evening. Don't think anyone will need to be reminded of the fairly average weather we've seen so far this year with uh, either a combination of too cold, too dry and, and plenty of rain as well. So look, in terms of uh, the relevance of fodder planning, I think it's very clear that with deficits out there, uh, there's a, a particular need to manage fodder uh, this particular season. So look, we're past peak milk production at this stage. We're also past peak grass growth. So it's um, you know time to be thinking about uh, what fodder stocks are available on the farm for the coming winter. Um, the year is moving on, but it's not too late to to take stock and understand what uh, levels stock, what levels of fodder you have on the farm. Look, with um, low volumes of carryover fodder from last year, we're very mindful of the importance of fodder levels for the common winter and here in Tierland, we've recently carried out a fodder survey and the results of that are, are, are fairly significant with both grass and fodder deficits and almost three quarters of the responding farms. Look, this evening we'll hear from two excellent speakers um, and, and very familiar to you, Joe Patton from Chagask and also Brian Hart, our nutritionist specialist, who bring us through the, the Tierland and also the National Fodder Survey results. Um, importantly, the next steps <clears throat> are really where it, where it matters and to help you understand where you are with your own farm and the options to bridge any gaps that are appearing on, on the farm. And, you know, while we still have a good amount of time to grow some grass to, to bridge any gaps. Um, our webinar this evening will be recorded and available afterwards on Tierland Farm Life and on our YouTube channel. So look, don't uh, forget to send in your questions on uh, Teams, the, the Q&A function in, in Teams there where you can write in your questions and add in your name and county as well. And we'll get an idea of who we're, who we're answering to. Um, just if there's any, um, we've had a few technical glitches this evening, so um, bear with us if there's any uh, technical hiccups as we go. Thanks very much. And I'll hand over now to, to Joe Patton. So that mightn't sound like 10% mightn't sound like a huge amount, but it's significant now because, as we always say in these situations, you know, a 10% deficit at the start of the winter will turn into a 100% deficit at the end of the winter. So, you know, it's a couple of weeks feeding basically is what's missing. And maybe perhaps a bit more worrying than that, Shane, is that second cuts in a lot of cases haven't really um, haven't really grown to the same extent because growth has been back nationally, obviously, over the period of time for second cut, right? And look at the other thing there too to say is that, you know, we looked at this across different regions and different scale of farm and all the rest of it. And like, there's not that much difference, to be honest with you, between, you know, the different regions of the country, between the eastern side, southwest, the uh, northwest and, and the middle and northeast. So I suppose more more relevant for the people on the on the call tonight is probably the Midlands and the and the eastern side, obviously, and they're running at sort of fifty eight, sixty percent, right? The only place in the country for me to say that looks pretty close to target is dry stock farmers in the west of the country, right? So look, there's work to be done, and there's there's it's it's work. It's very early, obviously. It's not that long since first cuts were done, but um, and second cuts obviously started in some areas and in, in a lot of areas, but. You know, it's just to put that emerging um, potential for a, for a shortage in in some bit of context. So, have you you've the bar chart up there, Shane? We'll move on maybe yeah. to the next bit, right? So, if that's making sense, like just you know, just to say that, you know, we should have seventy percent plus in hand, and on average, it's sixty percent. Now, I would just make one quick point before we move on to the next bit is that that obviously varies. There's about half the farms that we surveyed were said that they were pretty much on target and the other half weren't or there or thereabouts, which means that obviously the deficit on the farms that have a deficit is big. It could be 20% of the deficit, if you get me. So we're seeing that spread. We're seeing lots of farms with quite significant issues and little under half, I would say, are sort of on target or pretty normal. So where there is a problem, it's a problem, a relatively big problem for some farms, right? So the next thing we looked at, if we just move on, is this... Um, you know, we asked the question and it's something we always think about is, OK, you're short, but now what, I suppose? And we just ask, you know, have, have, have people that have identified themselves short, have they made any provision? Have they done anything about it as of yet? And half the respondents said that on a dairy perspective, 50 percent said they have done something, mostly about trying to secure extra area for second cut. 
and when we asked the same question of the dry stock farms, we we have seen that 60, 66 or two thirds of dry stock farms that are short have really not thought about or done not much to date about what they need to do to fill the gap. Right. So really, we're just get the point. There's a significant enough deficit just emerging. It's not unmanageable by any means. It can be closed um, if we get a relatively a few actions will close the gap. But as it stands at the moment, pretty much half to two thirds of farms that have a, have a deficit haven't taken much action on it to, that, to date. So really, as we'll see later on, taking some action is the main is getting some action is the, is the main thing we, we should be talking about for the moment. Okay, now look at on maybe part of the action and the issue. If we just move on, is really around. Um, obviously, we need feed. Uh, we need additional feed, and we need to address the supply side on the feed uh, chain. But as we know, cash flow on farms is tricky enough in some cases, right? And it's this will the the, the fodder issue or the feed issue that possibly could emerge will create um, create its own issues. It's a cash demand, really, is what it is. So look at from a dairy perspective. We just asked the question about from a cash flow perspective, what's that going to look like? So um, about a quarter of farmers said, yeah, it's going to create a cash flow issue. Maybe 12 percent or one in eight said that they're going to have to do something about credits to make that to close the gap. And then maybe something around 45 to 55 percent really said they either had no issue or they didn't know yet what it's going to mean. So you could say, look, at a third of dairy farmers, you could say, have an issue or a little over it in terms of what it's going to mean for cash. And one in eight are looking at yeah, it's going to need some finance. So look at we need we need to be careful that when we talk about mitigation and we talk about you know filling the gap and but if it's extra feed or whatever else, there's there's a, there's a cash concern there as well and sort that out early to try and make the problem you know to make the problem a bit more manageable is the, is the message or look, look at it from from that perspective. So that's there's a bit of concern there I would say for some people for sure around uh, cash and that's not that's not simple by any means. And that will have to be solved on, on, on a one-to-one -one basis in, in most cases, right? So just briefly, and again, just to, 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 to move on through the, the slides, I suppose, onto the, just to give, I suppose, we could have looked at this from the start, and it's no surprise uh, to people that look at, you know, today it's like, where does all this come from? Or is it any surprise that those are the figures in the father survey? Not really. Uh, and the reason is that, Look, a growth rate to date on farms is back something in the region of three quarters of a ton to a ton of dry matter. That's what it's back relative to the five year average. So if you're looking at the chart there, the dark, the black line or the dark line, as you can see, uh, the darkest line on that is kind of the, is your is this year's uh, curve, if you like. You can see it was significantly behind through April, May, recovered in May to be normal, but has dropped back since and kind of has recovered in the last couple of weeks to be relatively, relatively normal. So currently growing 55 to 65 kilos on a lot of farms which is still kind of a little bit behind average but it's still kind of getting closer to it's more closer to normal but still on some farms there's, there's issues of course demand is at 50 to 60 kilos that's including concentrate going in to keep it at that so as we see at the moment growth is just about meeting demands and we have the issues of quality that we might get to into questions uh, but still look at the thing to say is that if there is, we get a bit of temperature and a bit of rain. I know we've rain where I am this evening, and it's it's probably very welcome in the in the southeast. Um, temperature and rain. If we get those and it gets somewhat normal, you will get a nitrogen response. Like, and what I'm trying to say there is that just because things have been poor up to this point doesn't mean that if things normalise with weather, we will still could get a, a decent response of maybe twelve to fifteen kilos of grass grown for every kilo of nitrogen spread in the next month to six weeks so there's there's scope there i would say that if, if we get be relatively better conditions we could still be able to grow a bit to, to close a gap so look if there's an issue shane i know we may come to us in the discussion that you know using the fertilizer allowance that we have so double check your fertilizer allowance and i would say that strongly that don't assume um or don't think that you know that you're done in terms of fertilizer allowance. it's very important to go and check on a one-to-one -one basis with your advisor, with your with your with your um with, with your with your agri advisor, whoever that may be, just to double check to say, yeah, now how much nitrogen have I left um in the tank, let's say, and get the use of that allowance because obviously those allowances are worked out to be to be what the farm is allowed and it's good farming practices to, to hit those and to, to, to meet those. But look at there's probably a, there, I, we've seen it on some farms lately that there is more allowance maybe on farms there's a bit less spread in the spring than other years 
it, there could be a bit of additional fertilizer that could be used for driving on a third cut or something like that if needed, right? So look at very briefly on the third cut idea, look at something in the region of 60, 65 kilos, that's about, let's call it 55 units or thereabouts, we call it 65 kilos of nitrogen and a bit of P and K to match the nitrogen. So sort of 65, 60, something like that with a bit of P along, alongside that should be enough to sort of drive a reasonable third cut if you have the allowance for it. So look at a couple of thousand gallons of slurry and a bag of urea or maybe a bag, a little over a bag of urea, a protected urea on your um, on your silage ground. If you have an area that you could suitably for third cut, there's going to be a decent, um, there's going to be a decent enough response to that if it's, if your second cut is taken out at this point and it's re-fertilized for a third cut in sort of early you know early September time or mid-September time, there's some option there, Shane. So look at very briefly, growth is meeting demand at the moment, but there's no surpluses emerging, which is always a you know, that was always closed the gap for a lot of people. You know, if we get the bit of temperature and a bit of rain, there is, there will be a nitrogen response if we get if we get that coming through. Uh, it'll be somewhere in the region of 12 to 1, 15 to 1, something like that. So there's an economic response to nitrogen, obviously. Double check your allowance. I mean, we can't get into it on the call for everybody, but for your individual one-to-one, make sure that you're, you make sure you know exactly how much you've left and um, and double check it and spread your allowance, basically, if you're short on feed. And the final thing is then it's in and around that. That's on a kilos per hectare basis. So units per acre will be obviously a bit less than that on, on paper. So in around 60, 65 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, match that with K. So 2,000, little over 2,000 gallons of slurry plus a bag and a bit of protected urea on some parts of the farm to grow a third cut. Very, very much worthwhile if if you have the allowance to do it because it will always be cheaper than trying to go out and buy silage on the stem machine. But obviously we have to, as we said earlier, the cash flow issue is something that is catching people and that again needs kind of one-to-one attention I would say. All right so that's it in a nutshell. Okay. Joe thanks very much for that really uh, really interesting information there Um just I have one question for you Joe before before we go into Brian and then we'll have come to Q&A yeah. later but say someone who does their sums and they haven't got the full fertilizer allowance to go with that 65 units of nitrogen um, could you go with 45.50 and you're short on slurry, but see, could you get, go with 45.50 or would you try and scrape it up from somewhere else and, uh, and hold off on I grazing ground? You, of course, look, you will know, I would keep the, gra- the grazing ground needs it, Shane. I think it yeah. needs it. Um, mm-hmm. So like we're, but we're, we've seen in some farms and just, you know, just to reiterate, like we have seen in some farms where people are a little further back on nitrogen to date than they realise. There's a bit of an allowance still in place, and yeah. what I'm talking about there is, you might only be talking about twenty percent or twenty percent of the farm area that you're going to grow a third cut on. So, going an extra ten kilos or fifteen yeah. kilos on that area is only going to, if you take it on a whole farm basis, it's only on a small oh. area of the farm. So it's only going to yeah. be two or three kilos for the per hectare across the whole farm, if you know, if you know what I'm saying. So, oh, sure, so that's that's the only thing I'd say there. So, but make sure. The, the priority still has to be making sure that the grazing ground, and I think in a lot of cases, because quality has been under a bit of pressure and people have done a bit of correction work and have t- you know topped a bit and taken out a few bales, uh, that kind of stuff, taking getting rid of the, the poor quality stuff, the priority would be get make sure that there's nitrogen to grow grass to feed the milkers at the moment. But if there's yeah. a bit left in the tank, you know what to do, get a bit of third cut out and use the slurry to help grow that as well. Ideal. Thanks very much, Joe. Look, we'll, okay, we'll, okay. we'll move it on and we'll come back to the questions there in a bit. Um, so, look, we'll, we'll move straight over to yourself, Brian, and uh, I'll, I'll hand over to yourself to cover off the tier lawn survey and also the options and scenarios for, for uh, what people can do if there's a shortfall. Thanks very much, Ed, and good evening, everybody. So what I'm going to quickly do is just run through our actual Tier Lawn's own fodder survey results. We sent out a fodder survey to our 4,500 milk suppliers. Of that, we got five, 587 respondents. Now, naturally enough, when we send out a survey about uh, fodder shortages, those who might be getting affected with it most uh, will, will respond. So. Uh, they could be slightly biased on the figures by just who might have responded to them, but they very much line up with the, uh, the figures Joe has just presented and the Chagas figures. And ultimately, when you look at some of the highlights of it, uh, of our survey into your lawn, 82% identified themselves as being currently tight on grass. 
53% of those are currently feeding higher concentrate levels, like what Joe said, to extend grass and keep that, say, demand uh, where it needs to be. Uh, 75%, I think it's one of the more surprising figures, that 75% of, of uh, the suppliers that responded have no surplus bales in place currently, and 72% are behind where they should be for their winter fodder uh, targets. Uh, so as we go on to the next slide, what I'm just going to spend maybe a bit more time getting into is actually a couple of the examples that have been, or the, the queries that have come into us over the last uh, two or three weeks, and just different examples of farmers in different situations with different facilities that will um, that will have um, that 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 will have varying de degrees of shortages there. So the first farmer we're going to look at is a farmer with 83 cows and 16 heifers and 82 weanlings. So very much a typical farmer of what we'd be coming across on a on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? And looking at them for a five-month winter, the requirement there for that farm is going to be 1,055 tonnes of silage, okay? Now, when you look at the first and second cut that are actually currently in the pits and some, some say, bales that have also been taken, what they have available to them currently is 940 tonnes, okay? Now, typically this farmer wouldn't take a third cut and this is where he, they generally would stop, but it's ultimately leaving a deficit there of 115 tonnes or 11% behind, uh, behind where they need to be for the winter. Now, this farmer, when we begin to start talking about what we're going to do for the winter, there's a couple of things that it was made very clear that they don't have a diet feeder, so they won't be able to incorporate a great deal of straw or didn't want to go down looking at straight or anything like that, because ultimately feed space was also limiting as well. So as we go on to the next slide, we'll see some of the solutions that this farmer was actually putting in place. And look, typically this farmer, yes, wouldn't take a third cut of silage, but just in this instance is going to have to look at putting that out. And that's ultimately what they have done. And doing that in 15 to 20 acres is going to give you a, a potential silage yield of 75 tonnes. Now, the next point you're going to see in every one of the three scenarios we have here, and I think it's it's because it's so important, we have to utilise what fertilizer, what slurry we have at the moment and for the rest of the season to grow as much grass as possible. You know, if we're able to grow as much grass as possible, it'll keep growth above demand. We'll be able to make surplus bales if, say, if if we grow too much. And in a month's time, we'll be talking about building a grass wedge. And look, that's all very, very important. It's going to be the best quality feed we can get. It's going to be the cheapest we can get. So it's just very much at this point, it might feel like it were, it's already looking at winter fodder demands. But if we take action in time, we have plenty of options. This farmer, like what Joe touched on there earlier on as well, this farmer is maintaining, to say, the concentrate feeding levels uh, uh, at the moment and for the next while. And that's ultimately just to try and reduce that demand so that growth will be able to catch up there as well. But most importantly, this farmer, after the third cut, will do another fodder budget in early September to see exactly where they were uh, to what, uh, after they have their third cut as well. So as we go on to say the second second uh, case study or farmer that we have, we're probably getting into a, a bigger deficit here. Uh, this farmer, again, has 182 cows, uh, 41 calves and 38 heifers. Now, one of our business managers sat down and went through the fodder, uh, fodder planner with them and came back and uh, showing that for a five month winter, again, was looking for around 1,847 tonnes of silage. Now, uh, this farmer between first cut that's in the pit and second cut that's still yet to be cut and a theoretical third cut, we have about 1,513 tonnes available, but that is leaving a significant enough deficit of 317 tonnes or a 17% deficit. Now, this farmer was in a slightly better position, but ultimately grass had ran tight there about a month ago and 
ultimately ended up having to feed some of the first cut back with side hulls as a buffer feed. But look, it was the right thing to do at the time. An average farm cover is now recovering. They pulled a silage out of the diet, but they're keeping in, say, the side hulls there uh, and the five kilos of concentrate through the parlour, just allowing grass to build there as well. Um, now, as we look towards, say, what this farmer is actually going to, say, do in the winter time, this farmer would be used to, say, using a lot of straw to extend out uh, silage and that's very much the preference and they have a diet feeder so so that's ultimately the course that we're going down so as we go on to the next slide then we're able to see again the first and foremost important thing here is that this farmer is very much he's already been in contact with his child's advisor to find out what fertilizer they have left uh, they're going to utilize that with uh, uh, the slurry that they have on the farm to grow as much grass as early as possible. And look, if they make surplus bales out of it, all the better. It'll be all the less of a deficit we need to make up as well. Uh, this farmer already says he has the scanner man booked for uh, early September. And the minute that those he finds out what cows are empty or even low yielding cows, those cows will go be uh, will be sold. And that'll do two things. It'll obviously ultimately reduce the demand for overall fodder for the winter, but it'll also drop the demand for grass. And that's an important point to make that like it'll allow more grass for the rest of the cows so that we'll be able to keep grass into in the diet for longer as well in the in, as we head into the back end of the year. Uh, but ultimately the big deficit here is going to be made up of feeding uh, quite a bit of straw. He says he has unlimited access to straw. So he, what you're going to do there is feed four kilos of straw, straw along with concentrate through the diet feeder. Now, look, this needs to a bit of a health warning at times. Uh, silage quality needs to be assessed before we start adding large amounts of straw to it because we do need to balance out the energy in it there as well. But look, when it's done properly, in this example, you could save up to 260 tonnes of that deficit that's there as well. And again, the, one of the more important things this farmer is going to do a fodder budget in early September after the third cut to assess exactly where they are. And look, maybe that might even inform some of the decisions that they'd make on, say, the empty or the low yielding cows. So we go on to the final example then, and this was probably uh, one of the more severe situations that we would have come across. It's a farmer there with 128 cows and then uh, did 53 of a mixture of, say, bulling heifers and bullocks that they would traditionally fatten, say, come uh, uh, in February into March time as well. And they have 104 weanlings there as well because they generally keep the majority of the calves, okay? Uh, the fodder requirement for the five month winter in this example is 1,733 tonnes. So obviously a significant amount given that you're feeding all the weanlings and bullocks there as well, okay? So again, between first cut is in the pit, second cut and the theoretical third cut, we have, we have about 12 165 tonnes available to us, but it is leaving a very significant gap of 468 tonnes, which is 27% behind where they need to be, you know. Now, unfortunately, look, uh, this farmer couldn't could have done very little else uh, because ultimately they were running out of grass and they decided to graze some of the first cuts. That's ultimately how we ended up in this situation. But now look, grass is recovering, feeding concentrate in the parlour, uh, but there is a severe deficit to be made up of that 27% or 468 tonnes. Uh, and then as we move to the next slide, probably because there's a, a good bit of say the deficit is so big in this situation, we're going to have to look at a number of different options. And it's it's uh, a bit like a menu, I suppose, that you could, uh, we're, we're, that a farmer could choose from, okay? But the one thing on the menu that will have to be adhered to is just growing as, again, growing as much grass through the utilization of fertilizer and slurry as much as possible. Now, in these type of situations, Look, buying silage is obviously going to be one of the one of the best options, but just this farmer was questioning some of the availability and also say quality for feed he was going to try feed to milking cows or finishing animals. Uh, whole crop is certainly an option. This farmer is in a, a pretty strong tillage region, so that could have been an option. Um, and as well as that, look, one of the main options for this farmer is to reduce stock. 
uh, just to reduce that fodder demand because the gap is so big at the minute. So you'd be looking at potentially offloading bullocks early, whether that's through a mart, whether that's finishing them earlier, but also then looking at, say, low yield in our empty cows just to get them out, uh, out of the system in time as well. Uh, Straw will be a good option here as well, but say unlike the farmer, an option too here, this farmer doesn't have a diet feeder. And it's important to, to maybe draw this out a little bit that even though you might have straw and you put it in front of cows, don't expect that cows will naturally go for the straw and you'll all of a sudden displace a whole heap of silage. If you are doing that, you first of all need to test silage to make sure it's the proper quality uh, that we're not lowering the energy too much, but you may also need to restrict the cow's actual silage to, uh, to, to get them to take in some of that straw. And that goes for concentrates as well. Uh, there was a call in today to say, uh, I've I've 72 DMD silage, but I just don't have enough of it. And I think I'm going to feed two or three kilos of, uh, of a ration there to extend it. That's that's OK, but like it won't automatically displace two or three kilos of dry matter grass and you could end up with with quite fat cows as we head towards calving and that's not where we need to be. So again, just if you are, it's probably the importance of contacting a, 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 your tier lawn business manager, your, your child's advisor, and just talking through the options here and making sure that it is done correctly. But most importantly for this farmer, there will be monthly fodder budgets done throughout basically for the rest of the year, just to fi find out exactly where that farmer is. So look, as we just draw to a conclusion, I just want to say, have a bit of a summary on it on the next slide. And ultimately, what we want people to remember from here is we want to maximize as much grass growth now as possible between now and the back end of the year, okay? Do a fodder budget, do it early, identify the deficit, okay? Continue that on a monthly basis if it's if it's requirement, okay? Acting early will save everyone a lot of time and money and effort here as well, you know. And when we do act early as well, there is loads of options from, you know, buying whole crop, beet, straw, buying grass on the stem, buying grass silage, maize silage, you know. So there is loads of options there at the moment. And like, look, after that, after that much needed rain today, we should get good growth as, as as well, you know. But ultimately, just make sure you contact your tier lawn gain business manager, your Chagas advisor, or wh whatever advisor you're dealing with, just to put a plan yeah. in place. So thanks, Shane. I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Brian. Top class information again. A lot to take in there. Um, hopefully, people are finding themselves in the and the lesser of those scenarios, but some really good options when when things are fairly severe um on the farm and um, look we we go straight into questions i think look so, thanks to everyone who sent in the questions and, and there's a good number of questions in we'll go through them now but um just a reminder to put them into the q a function on teams uh, you'll find it there on your phone or on your pc uh, and and if you'd like to also include your name and the county you're you're texting in from it'll just give us an idea of, of what part of the country you're in um Joe, I'd say this one's uh, for ye. I'm running tight on grass and they don't measure grass. What What's their options? Running tight on grass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, the um, the first thing is, I suppose, Shane, is to, to just, if you're not measuring, try and look at rotation and see where it's at. Do you know, it's, it's what rotation length are you going at? So, like, the, the trouble is, I think, if we let rotation and drop too quickly and, the gra and grass disappears off the farm. So try and get to a sort of a 20, hold it at a 20, 22 day round at least. I think growth, there's a bit of rain in places, it might it might recover, but just try and get to that 20 something, 20 odd, 21 day rotation. And that's, you know, that's kind of just take the farm and say, look, it's divided as into divided into 20 sections, if you know what I mean, in your head and uh, as 5% oh, don't graze more than sort of 5% of the farm per day kind of a thing. So that your mm. whole rotation and mm. if then let's say, for example, for argument's sake, that um, that that equates to a hectare per day and there isn't enough feed on that hectare to um, feed the herd, don't go further than that hectare but just put in the feed that you would need to feed the herd fully, if that makes sense. It's a shorthand way of doing it. So what I'm trying to say there is like, don't keep grazing until you run out because it's not a drought situation as such. It's just 
slow slow growth, not no growth. So in that situation, you may have to just say, right, OK, I'm not going to graze more than 5% of the farm every day. And you're going to say then, oh, geez, that 5% isn't able to feed the herd for the day. You know, let's say you're milking 100 cows, yeah. you might say, right, I'm short 20 cows worth of feed. There's an option to feed silage to that 20 cows, if you know what I'm trying to say. So there's, you know, you don't have to feed every cow if you're short, you just feed the ones that are you're short for. So I would be saying, yeah. like, in that situation, put in silage at milking or silage at night, or even keep back 20% of the herd, a different 20% every, every couple of days. You're going to go to sort of up to six kilos a meal in the parlor and try and hold the cows steady at that. The one thing we don't want to do is be pinching the cows too much and, you know, speeding up our rotation. That's going to cause us, you know, that's going to cause us problems over time. So like whole rotation, make sure you're grazing out. Don't just put in feed and keep the cows moving through the area. You just waste grass. So that's what we need to be doing. Rotation, rotation, rotation. Get that right first and supplement what you're short, Shane. Hulls can yeah. work very well. Some of the other high fiber straights can work very well. If there's a bit of bale silage in the short term, that can work very well also. Uh, so yeah. look at that's that's where we need to be at. I, I, I think running the farm down to nothing is 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 going to mm. cause problems. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, another one that's linked. I'll just throw these in together because they're they're yeah. very linked. Joe and I'll give them. All. Growth is poor. I don't have a lot of grass, but the quality of the gra that grass is poor. Should I still be topping? And then another one on if they're short on silage uh should is zero grazing a good option okay two things right so the first one on the topping i wouldn't be topping everything you'd have to look at where growth is i think you will have to correct every every paddock nearly needs to be corrected at some point so you would try certainly that the ones that are very the ones that are very heavy or that you don't get through you would probably have to do some bit of topping but i wouldn't be doing a full round of it shane it'll probably it, it will reduce the growth rate and we have seen that on some farms so i would be taking out the worst of the paddock so that might equate to maybe a quarter of them or a third of them possibly might get topped this time and you might have one more go at it in, in the next it, you might just get one more go at it over the next couple of weeks so i'd be just a bit concerned like if it's really bad you would have to take it out of it for sure but don't be going in doing sort of if, there, if you're thinking it may or may not need to be topped and you're very tight on growth rates, you'd probably err on the side of leaving it out if you could get away with it because I'd just be a bit concerned on growth rate. But there is no doubt that there's a lot of paddocks there that do need to be they do need to be corrected. So it's a tricky one. Uh, it's it's a tricky one to call, you know, but just be careful. It will it will clip growth a little bit. Right. So I would be saying. Yep. You might be able to mow out some of it and 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 pre mow if it's not great either. Like it'll still have an effect on growth. So I would say the severe ones, yeah, you have to correct the quality before you start building grass. But I wouldn't be saying just blindly going around and tapping the whole place because I think that will slow the growth too much. To be honest with you, so use it strategically. Maybe a quarter to a third of the farm you might get done and and go from there. That's it's yeah, hard to yeah. say unless you see paddock by paddock on the zero grazing one. Look at zero grazing. Yeah, if if depending on how you're set up, if you want to be get it done, you could you could do you could do some of it if you have access to outside land. You could do some of it if you don't have a zero grazer. It can be done by contract. Um, there's other ways around that too. I know some people would have done that situation, no access to a zero grazer. They've just great. They've just baled baled grass green, not not wrapped it and fed it back out. In severe cases, that has they've seen that been done on smaller herds, mm -hmm. and it works fine. It's, you know, you can just bale up the green crop and feed it out. You know, you'll it not last now. You'll only be able to do it over sort of. You, it won't last. Same as anything fresh grass will not last more than sort of a feed nearly. 